This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out the YouTube original channel UCTV Prime at youtube.com slash uctv. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this evening's Exploring Ethics program here at the Reuben H. Fleet Science Center. I'm Mike Kalichman. I'm director for the Center for Ethics in Science and Technology. I'm also a professor at UC San Diego. As many of you know, the Ethics Center occupies an unusual and possibly unique space in public discourse. We aren't interested in solely talking to the public. Our goal is to create conversations with the public about science and technology and the ethical challenges that go with that science and technology. As you can tell from our name, we are interested in the ethical dimensions of science and technology, which means we tend to focus on two kinds of broad questions. One is, how should we best make use of that science and technology? And the other one is, and it's an equally important question, is how should we best conduct the research that provides the new discoveries and developments? Tonight's program will focus more on that second question, and it also relates directly to themes that many of you heard about during our Henrietta Lacks series of programs that just completed last month. The overall question to be addressed tonight is how should we best conduct clinical research? Embedded in that general question, are many specific questions you might want to particularly keep in mind during the course of this evening's discussion. These include, do we really need to conduct clinical research? If so, then who should participate in studies designed to answer questions about something about which we don't yet know whether it's effective or safe? Why should people participate in research studies? And why should people not participate in research studies? Do enough people participate in those clinical trials and research studies? And if not, then is this because those people are reluctant to participate? They don't want to participate for one reason or another? Is it because they aren't aware of the research studies? Or is it both? And then finally, is there a role, and this is our specific question for tonight, is there a role for community agencies and patient advocacy groups to help increase participation in clinical research studies? To help us address those questions, we are terribly fortunate to have Dr. Howard Terrace, Director for the Community Engagement Unit of UC San Diego's Clinical and Translational Research Institute. I've known Howard for several years now, and it is hard to imagine someone who might be more engaged in working with the community as a clinician, as a teacher, and as a researcher. He's the perfect person to help us navigate these questions this evening. I want you to please join me in welcoming Dr. Terrace as our speaker tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, those were those were excellent questions, uh, Mike, to uh, to bring up. Um, why do people participate in research? You know, should they feel they should participate in research, et cetera? Um, and I'm I'm going to take the discussion away from the general public specifically, or at least only the general public specifically, because. I think that to reach the general public and find out whether they feel they need to participate in research, um, whether there's an obligation to, et cetera, um, it's hard to have a conversation with the general public. And that's why um, my feeling is that it's community agencies and that have to represent much of the general public. And it has to be you know, universities and other academic institutions that represent investigators. And so what I'm going to be exploring today is what is the relationship between those institutions? And then I'll get down maybe to some of those other questions. Now, I have to um, apologize. Um, Dr. Kalichman asked me to um, speak. And he says, you know, it's much better if you can just talk and not use slides. Um, so I, I won't use slides. I can do that, I think. But uh, you have to know that um, I'm the sort of person that even at someone's wedding, 
speaks with PowerPoint. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did bring little bits of notes here, um, but excuse me if I, I search for words or thoughts. Um, so exploring the relationship, when I, when I, let me first do, start with definitions, and let me first start with the community definitions. Um, when you define a community, there's many different ways to define that. Um, obviously, geographic community. So you can think of, say, people that live in Chula Vista. And there are agencies that represent a community like that. There's a community, you know, Chula Vista Collaborative. There's many of the agencies that um, comprise the Chula Vista Collaborative. Um, and they, um, there are many other um, agencies can represent a community. Very often, community clinics um, get people from their geographic area or a certain uh, region of the city or the county. Um, and so there's another, geogra there's another community. You can have rural communities or very urban communities, etc. cetera. Um, the other way to define community is by ethnicity or race. These people don't have to live anywhere near each other, and yet they share some common things because of uh, their race or because of their ethnicity or language. Um, we all know community agencies that represent people um, with that uh, common characteristic. So for example, the Urban League um, or the Asian Pacific Islander community has representatives in various agencies. The third type of community would be a common experience of some sort. Um, you may think of veterans as having a common experience. They were all um, in, um, in the military. They are, um, there are sub-communities of that. Some fought in foreign wars, some fought in um, wars of long ago, others just came back from Afghanistan, um, and they all have their own community agencies that represent them. Um, other Communities of common experience uh, may be, say, uh, gay and lesbians, and you know you've heard of agencies that represent them. Even even age is a community, so that there are communities of senior citizens, and there are agencies that represent them. Um, the last one, which uh, Mike mentioned as advocacy organization, patient advocacy organizations, these are the sorts of agencies that represent. Um, people either with a common disease or their families, say the American Lung Association, um, the more important communities um, of those sorts are the ones that have recently formed um, of the very rare diseases. Um, usually when there are such rare diseases and there's only two or three in any one city, um, that's not much of a community or an agency that represents them, but now with the internet, um, almost even the most rare diseases very often have um, um, a community leader um, because uh, that's the person that runs their website um, or runs their blog, etc. And then, of course, um, disability. Disability is another kind of community because if people have a sensory disability, if they're blind, if they're deaf, they have certain common needs and so they have their own representatives. Um, so when I'm talking about community agencies, um, you can see that they're, they're all very different. Um, the common characteristics that all community agencies have, whether it's geographic or ethnic, racial, etc., is they provide services to their community members. They, they provide a service. They also in some ways, however, advocate for their uh, community members and represent them to outsiders. So the, the flip of being a representative of your community to outsiders um, or a bridge to outsiders is that if you're a bridge, you're also to some degree a gatekeeper um, in that there are certain things you may want to protect your community from or not want them, you may not pass along every of information that the outsiders want your community to know if you're that representative. And so it's, um, it's the two edges of the knife um, for, rep for when you think of the role of those community agency leaders. Um, enough for community for a minute. I'm going to go now switch to um, researchers and, and, and academia. Um, I'm a pediatrician, so I'm a member of a department of pediatrics. But I'm also a member of another department, and, and that's also at UCSD, um, and it's called the Clinical and Translational Research Institute. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, and I don't think it really describes to the general public 
what we do and what it's about. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit of an example there. But what we mean from when we say translational research is how when you start off with a scientific idea, it's usually uh, not starting off with experimenting on a patient in a clinic. You usually starts off in a lab, in a test tube, or maybe even an animal model. Um, and from then, or even a computer simulation. Um, um, but then it moves into animal models and then human models. And finally, if you have a drug that works, or you have a new lab test that, you, that has been experimented with, or a new radiological technique, um, or a new behavioral change, say diet or, or something, um, then it moves into the public sector. If it's been proven to work, you still have to translate it even further. You have to translate it into something that people accept, that something that insurance companies pay for, something that public health promotes, something that doctors think of when they're ordering. Um, so there's a lot more translation even after something has been proven to be effective. Um, the, the National Institutes of Health, as well as many other research institutions, are actually very uh, concerned because it takes several decades for an idea to get from the lab bench to being paid for and accepted and utilized by the public. It's just, it's far slower than it has to be. And my institute, the Clinical and Translational Research Institute, the one that I work for at UCSD, they have only really one purpose, and that is to hasten and improve uh, the translation of research from the very earliest stages to the latest. And there are many problems that we have to deal with in that institute when we try to do that. But it's, and many of the problems are internal to our institution, to our university. So um, if you were to look at allocation of resources, if you look at redundancy, you know, every single researcher has to go find a statistician somewhere. Every researcher go has to find lab space somewhere. Every researcher has to go find someone that'll help them write a grant, et cetera. And, and that's basically how things have been in medical schools for years. And this, there's federal funding for institutes like ours to say centralize, you know, have a pool of statisticians that can work for, you know, one researcher when he's writing his grant and needs a statistician and then move to another one. Have lab space that can be shared, have one person doling it out. You know, and so a lot of the, a lot of what is making everything very slow um, is internal and we are trying to fix a lot of that internally. However, um, there's more. It's it a little bit, it goes to the questions that Dr. Kalichman had, had raised earlier, which is there is a lot of, um, there's a paucity of involvement of the general public in research, and, and in many ways, um, an understanding and approving of funding for research from our national government and from foundations, um, volunteering for research as human subjects, allowing a family member um, to volunteer as a research as a human subject, and, and, and why is this? Why do we have so few people that are really um, involved. Why is, why do so many studies, um, a, probably a majority of studies, never hit their target figures for how many people they enroll? Um, and certainly if they hit them, they never hit them by their target date of when to enroll them. So everything is very slow. And, and there's many reasons that people don't join research studies. And the single most important and prevalent reason that people don't join research studies is because they've never been asked to. Be, and reaching the general, I don't know how many people here have ever been asked to be in a research study, but, but we don't necessarily have the best ways to find people. And if you ask people over the past 10 years, how did you best find research studies? And we, we've done this kind of survey. We find it was from Craigslist, for those who are you know, computer literate, and it was from the reader, for those who get the reader. And that's how we find people for research studies. Um, it's not exclusively, but that is sometimes what um, we have to rely on as the single best way. Um, um, once you do reach people, um, why don't they join? 
the reason that I probably wouldn't join when I'm asked, and that's because I'm too busy. I mean, I can hardly come home and then check my email and, and, and meet with family and have dinner and, and to all of a sudden join a research study. When? When are you going to fit it in? This is our, our new American lives. Um, there are other things. Um, a lot of you have attended the Henrietta Lacks series, and you know how much distrust there is of being a guinea pig, of being a lab rat. I'm not going to try out something, and uh, you know, where's the, you know, I'm not going to test something out uh, to see if um, it kills you or not. <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> and then there's the last thing, and that is um, low scientific literacy. We really do not have um, a, um, an incredibly literate public when it comes to science. If we, and, and again, they're, they, these are all written up. In, in journal articles, but if you ask the average person, what does randomization mean? What does it mean to have a control group? What does it mean that it's a blind study? You know, it's not universally understood. And when we had focus groups with very many communities, and I mean members of the general public, um, about um, how they understand research, um, they, uh, very often you get the feeling that they don't see it as a very organized thing that has a lot of tight controls on it, that things aren't tested out for you to see if it's going to kill you, that it's already been tested out in a lot of animals beforehand and then it starts with lower doses and there's safety built in and that, you know, to a lot of them it's like, oh, my doctor's going to try a new drug on me and he'll call me up and ask me how it's going, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of um, reticence to do that. Um, understandably. So you can see where the agency that represents any which community becomes very important. You can see the role of that agency. Um, how do people volunteer? Well, community agencies have successfully been used in the past. Whether you're going to a school to recruit someone, uh, children for a, you know, an, a childhood eczema study, or whether you're going to a community clinic to recruit people, I have to say there's been disasters and there's been successes, and I will first describe the successes. Um, the successes are when um, the, the agency gets something out of it too. Um, either they feel like they're at the cutting edge and they maybe really are at the cutting edge, or they feel it's the right thing to do for their population, it's part of their goal. Um, they're in the grant, there have been some perks to that agency, financial or other resources that have been put into that. Um, maybe not to the agency, but to the CEO sometimes. <laughs> they want to be on the paper, um, something like that that's important to them. Um, so we have many examples of, of, of where things have gone right. It also goes right when it's a true partnership. When the academic investigator, when the researcher that, that meets that agency doesn't say thanks and, um, and then in between grants you never hear from them anymore. Um, the true partnerships um, where they stay in touch, once you're on their board, they give you a free lecture once a year or whatever, those have helped. And, and, and those have been ways to reach the community and describe all the ways that, all the misconceptions about research, you can be done through a trusted agent and that's the agency leaders, the people that work there. Um, there have been some unsuccessful partnerships as well. Um, and we hear all kinds of stories. Um, one example is it's every, everyone understands that when we take, when the scientists come and they take data, whether it's blood tests or uh, urine tests or surveys, um, that um, the agency says, well, I really want those results too. And the, you know, it's all understood. Okay, you'll get the results. We'll have the results and we'll give them to you. But then the IRB explains, well, you know, you can't give them the results with the patient's name on it. You can only give them the unidentified <laughs> results. So that's happened to community agencies who have, you know, really spent a lot of time trying to help um, recruit people and, and do testing maybe of that blood in their own, in their own facilities, et cetera, and then they don't find out this. Um, it's not how they perceived it. Um, universities may not be able to pay on time. We've had some results of that. Um, we've had one where the, um, we've been told where the principal investigator from university said, well, I'm writing the paper, I'm going to be the first author on this paper. And the agency said, well, it's our data and it's our patients and we want to be the first author on the paper. Most agencies don't care, this one did. 
Um, so there's many times when uh, things can go wrong from these representatives. Sometimes the agencies want to modify the research so much that it no longer is a valid experiment. Um, um, sometimes the agencies want total control and um, we've had very poorly written grant applications because the university was too worried about taking over control and, and they know how to write grants better than the agency for certain foundations or certain health institutions. So on both sides there's been breakage of, of, of um, good relationships. And there are some natural ten, uh, tensions that I think we have to be aware of. Um, and I'll give you some examples. Um, take veterans, I mentioned them before. Um, we at the CTRI, we at our Clinical Translational Research Institute, you know, we think of veterans in San Diego as a very, very important um, part of our, of, our glo of our community globally here because they make up about 12 or 13 or 14 percent of our population. If you count their family members, it's even larger. There are like 250,000 or 240,000 um, in San Diego County. They are, suffer very many health disparities and um, between them and their families, they're just a massive group. So, you know, how come we haven't had great success in reaching veterans? We, it's, it's the community agencies have been wonderful, but um, they have their own restrictions, they have their own goals. So, for instance, the Veterans Administration Hospital, um, the VA, um, they are not allowed as part of their charter to actually talk to anybody or recommend or make people aware of any research that's not VA research. They would like to, but it's the people we speak to would like to, they kind of feel badly about it, but they can't. Um, it, unless it's research that's going on at the VA, if it happens to be going on at San Diego State or UCSD, they can't do that. So here's an agency that is willing to help but really is not in position. Other veterans agencies we've reached, um, they, um, some of them are trying to help find veterans find work and they, they think that this would be too distracting. It's just not on a, a primary goal. So there are many, many agencies out there. We've contacted everything from um, the, um, uh, what do you call those clubs? The um, um, Veterans of Foreign Wars. We've gone to, we went to United Veterans Council and spoke to a whole bunch. And yet, no one, it's just not high enough on their list, you know, um, to, to basically have us speak to their people for 10 minutes, even when we provide free lunch. <laughs> um, health disparities, um, Latinos, Native Americans, you would think, okay, there are so many, these people die earlier from diabetes and other ailments because they have such high health disparities. You think, and health disparities are partially because they're very underrepresented in research. So are their community agencies inviting us in? Please come, you know. We need you to help recruit our people. Um, it's a different way of thinking. What we find is that these organizations are very service-oriented oriented organizations. They provide service. And research is maybe not high enough on their list of things to spend a lot of time with us in, in doing. Um, so again, no animosity at all. Um, they think this is a great idea, but when it comes, push comes to shove as far as getting calls back, as far as getting access, it, it kind of falls to the bottom. Um, patient advocacy organizations are often the most enthusiastic. Um, they want more research dollars for their ailments, and they like when research uh, errors come up to them. They want faster research, and they, they want to see that speed of translation to move quicker than even we think we can do, but they're there with us. Um, it doesn't mean that it's totally problem free. Um, I remember using a high school to do, um, to test whether drug screening of athletes um, in order for them to join um, a sport was, uh, was something that was effective or not. And uh, we did this in some very conservative areas of the county and they, they were really excited, excepting that when we found that it wasn't that effective. <laughs> and that it actually may have discouraged people from joining sports who probably really needed to join them because their lives were not in disarray, they didn't like the response, you know what I mean? So, and, and the same thing with um, evidence-based uh, medicine, you know, when, when the Komen Foundation um, found out that if you really look at the hard science, there is no reason to do mammography on women between the ages of 40 to 49, well, that wasn't good. Then all that research partnership falls apart. So, so every, every, every organization um, 
is not necessarily a friend of research or sees it as a primary. And I'll take one last minute um, to think about primary care doctors and even specialty doctors. They're a natural. They see people that could maybe go you know, uh, to research. You know, here's someone with really, uh, with diabetes, I haven't been able to get under control, and I know this is a research study. Why aren't we getting more people from doctor's offices referring? And, and, and it's actually one of the few, it's one of the worst places to, to find. We can't get in there. Um, and they have many reasons of, them, of their own. And being a pediatrician and being in practice, I can tell you that I'm too busy to promote studies. I'm pr too busy to know which studies, while well, I'm running from room to room to room seeing patient, I'm too busy to try to think of which studies there are that are available and which ones have closed. And if someone says, oh yeah, I'm interested in that study, I have, I have to run, I'm usually running 20 minutes late, I have no time to actually sit and spend the time they need to tell them why. So I understand why many doctors won't um, do it, and they give us even some other reasons. Some of them are suspicious of big pharma. You know, they're spending time on doing all this so that pharmacy can make a drug that barely is different from a, a drug that already exists, but you know, another pharmaceutical company wants to have a, com a competitive edge. Um, or maybe they um, are worried that if they send them to, say, UCSD or to um, Scripps, where they're doing a lot of research, that Scripps or UCSD may steal their patient, um, or they may look, make them look like they're doing old-fashioned medicine because they're sending them to some place where it's, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more bleeding edge. So these are the issues I thought I would bring up as um, um, how we can really reach the general public and do community agencies play a role, and. Um, is there an obligation for community agencies and the general public um, to, to be a participant in research because everyone who's ever taken a pill in their life has benefited from scientific research? Um, so is there a give back? Um, some, some ideas to think about. Thank you. That was an excellent, at least for me, review of, of some of the issues. And I thought there were a few questions that might be useful to, to cover at the beginning before we hear from your specific questions. And I wanted to begin by, by noting, uh, Howard, you, you talked um, in great detail about a number of different kinds of things that come out of clinical research, what the Clinical and Translational Research Institute does. Could you speak for just a moment to the question, though, of why do we have to do that clinical research? Why, why do we need that step? What, I mean, I, for some people, I think that's obvious, for those who are in medicine and research, but right. for others, why, why can't we just do the studies in animals and do computer modeling and say, here's what you're going to do? Right. Um, you know, I almost think that the question is, um, why don't we need to do more clinical research before things come out? <laughs> because we, um, as you know, have... Um, have many new medications, many new lab tests, and everyone's all jumping on it. I, I, I can't, I, I remember as a pediatrician having a parent come to me and saying, um, there's this new um, medication and it's for kids with obesity and I want you to put my child on this. And um, there's some studies that are already out on it. And, and I said, well, I'm a little bit nervous about trying these new medications and I don't really know the side effects. I mean, I know that they've been okay in these small studies, but they've been small. and um, and, and I've had, uh, and I was very happy I never did because some of those new um, obesity drugs were taken off the market. They turned out to lead to um, heart disease in kids and skipped uh, arrhythmias, et cetera. And so I believe that nothing that we do, um, in, unless it's already proven the test of time, should be done without a lot of, a lot of research um, and, and, um, and maybe even more than, than we already do on it. So, the, so then a, a related question to that be is why can't we just do all those research studies in the perennial subjects we hear about? Why can't we do them all in medical students? <laughs> and why do we need anybody else? <laughs> right. Oh, good. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, we, there, there are, we have a lot of problems with health disparities because sometimes our volunteers tend to be um, white men. Um, they tend to be the ones that have the time, are kind of curious, um, um, have uh, want, want to reap the um, reimbursement for their time that they get for it, and um, and that's been a big mistake because we what we found is many of our treatments 
whether they're behavioral treatments or their lab tests or their uh, medications, um, have worked best in white men. And so what we need to do is we need to have a diversity of people in research in order to make sure that we have a, a far better handle on, on who this seems to work on. And in, in the future, we may, it may be all genetic. It may be that we'll know who various medications and tests and things work on based on their DNA, and, and we don't have to go through quite as much research. But <laughs> that's, that's still a long time away. We're talking about it, but it's still a long time away. Right, good. So, and, um, a question, that, and I, I hope that a lot of people in the audience will be thinking about their own answers to this next question, but um, we're hearing a lot of good reasons for doing research studies, for people to participate in them, diverse groups of people to participate, but are there reasons that individuals should consider not participating in a research study? Why should somebody say, no, that's great you're doing that study, but I shouldn't participate, even though you think I might be a good subject? Why would you not want to participate? No, oh, I think it's, a, I mean, a, it's an excellent question. And I, I do think there are people um, for whom uh, joining a research study is, is maybe not the best idea. Um, there, are, there are people who um, are very anxious. Um, there are people who um, um, have um, legitimate um, time concerns where anything would be far, far too disruptive to their lives. And if it's going to be that much of a burden on them, um, then, I, then I, I wouldn't want them to, to join a research study. Um, but I do think that um, if the anxiety is only because of the newness of this, or it's unfounded because of the um, suspicions uh, that research isn't safe, that are not true, or if it's because um, they would make time to do something else for society, um, but they're not doing it for this because it's just not high enough on their list of, um, of important things, then those are the people we're trying to convince. Okay, good. So although I have um, several other questions I could ask, I want to open this up to the audience, and I want to encourage virtually all of you to get to the microphone, even though we won't be able to get to all of you. It's part of the premise of this program, um, part of the ethical premise is that we need to hear from people, hear what their concerns are, hear their ideas about how these things can be better handled. And I can assure you that our plan, uh, both of us are at UCSD, I'm also associated with the Clinical and Translational Research Institute to provide research ethics support. And we're gonna take back the ideas that we hear from you. So what are your reactions to these challenges? What are your questions and what are your thoughts? And if, for those of you who would like to ask a question, there's a microphone here over to your right and you can line up there. I'm mostly curious to know what other people think about whether it's an obligation, um, say, akin to uh, giving blood. Some of us feel obliged to give blood because we accept blood when we need it in the emergency room. They feel, well, I should give blood sometimes if I'm going to be someone to accept. Is this, is this something that is on the same level? OK, so we have our first question. Uh, you mentioned up front that there are many different kinds of communities and that sometimes the leaders of these communities might get some sort of compensation if they, you know, get more people. So I would be worried possibly about the uh, potential for uh, harm in the sense that, let's say it's an, uh, an immigrant community, maybe most of them don't speak English very well, and somebody who's the leader is getting a buck for every person they can get into the study. So they may verbally twist arms or other kinds of coercion? That's an excellent, excellent question. Um, in, uh, I can tell you that for, um, for research that goes on in the institutions I work for, and that's UCSD, San Diego State University, Rady Children's Hospital, in those institutions, um, it would probably never fly to have someone earn money for everyone they go and recruit. They, that would not happen. That, that, that may happen with other institutional review boards, but I don't think it would happen with ours. However, there are other things that are in the favor <laughs> of these people. So for example, we may pay for 10% of that person's salary um, uh, for that year, 20% of that person's salary for a year, that leader of that organization, because we realize it's taking their time, they are having to devote themselves to research thoughts that they, and, and activities that they didn't have to do before. Um, that person may also get gain by, if it's important to them, being a, a co-author on a published paper. 
Um, they may gain because they happen to be going for a master's or a PhD degree at the same time. And this research study, if they kind of get people from their own organization into it, you know, helps them with their degree. So even though the sort of the capitated dollar per person thing I've never seen happen, I agree that there are some um, other, other, other problems that, that may be a conflict of interest between are they really representing their community or are they abusing their community by trying to recruit them. And I think we just have to rely on the IRBs to ask the, uh, the institutional review boards to ask those questions and look at the procedures and make sure that the way people are recruited even within the community agency is done in an ethical way. And is, and is done in a way that is not coercive um, beyond what, um, um, beyond the, what is, is really ethical. If, Thank you. If I, if I could extend that just a bit. So my presumption, and for those of you who aren't as familiar with the review process, the Institutional Review Board is a campus, for UCSD, a campus-based committee that reviews the human subjects research and hopefully ensures that it's done in, in as ethical a fashion as possible. One of the things that I'm, I, I agree with Howard, they would not even consider approving would be to go to a community agency or group and say, we'll pay you $10 for each person that you recruit because there is that risk that you've raised. But um, unless I'm mistaken, I think a fairly common model is to turn to community physicians. For example, a trial will be done and they will be paid for each of their right. patients they bring into the study which I, I think a lot of people are concerned about the very real conflict of interest you just described. Um, and I don't know what UCSD's IRB's view is of those studies, whether they have any coming by. by yeah, I, I don't know of any, but there may indeed be. I, see, there was, I, I saw Arnie Gass here somewhere. Arnie might know. Where, where was Arnie? <laughs> Arnie, do you know if, that, if uh, community physicians studies where they pay them? There's lots of research that's done outside of formal academia. In fact, a lot of it uh, is the way that drugs come to market these days. And there are, there are other institutions in the world, in the country, other than universities that do clinical research. And some of them are for profit, and they, their clients are the drug companies, and their um, supply is from uh, community physicians. And um, it's, they, they're the ones that are more likely to pay for getting subjects from a community doctor's office. That's my, my quick answer to that question. Howard's shaking his head yes, so I think he understands. Yeah, I think they I'm definitely saying. do, yeah. 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 But, but anyway, I, I think those studies will be less likely to be occurring in the academic setting because the doctors are already in the academic setting and they wouldn't be in that, that role. But, so thanks. Um, next. Okay, so I, I'm trying to decide. I'm, I and my organization are either your ultimate lab rat or your worst nightmare. I'm trying to <laughs> figure that out. So actually, I'm a research scientist with the Mastocytosis Society. So as a pediatrician, you would know who I It's a, a rare disease. And actually, we uh, sort of research education and advocacy for people with mast cell disorders. So not only mastocytosis, but uh, mast cell activation and all the way up to mast cell leukemia. So. Uh, but a number of, but basically it's all rare diseases and um, maybe some of them not as rare but maybe more underdiagnosed. But over the last several years, I also am a scientist. So I'm a, a PhD cancer biologist and cellular immunologist working with the organization. And when I got involved with that organization, I really noticed that there was quite a bit of potential for the patients and the organization to work with the researchers and the different drug companies and diagnostic companies to come together to progress the research and uh, development of therapies and other and diagnostics and that sort of thing. Actually, honestly, even the diagnostic criteria and classifications of the disorders because since these are so rare, there this is exactly what you were talking about, about there are not that many patients who have um, any one of the disorders that we're looking at, but in one small area, but within the United States or within the world, we're actually a pretty big group. And that had been our problem, trying to find a way to bring the patients together to get enough patients together to get information to the doctors in a way that they um, could find useful. And so that's where we started out with a larger patient survey, and we're publishing that. We're working with Harvard, Harvard on that right now. 
Um, but there are a lot of, and then more specifically trying to create a patient registry and database and tie that into clinical samples. So we're starting to look at options that the NIH has and in, in down in the future. But um, coming at this from a research standpoint, we've been talking to biotech companies and they're interested in information from us and uh, speaking to and knowing a lot of the specialists. Um, there are a lot of ethical issues that come into play as well and considerations, especially that because it looks like that our specialists are too busy to deal with a lot of the issues of recruiting large amounts of patients from everywhere. They have, even our specialty centers have a small, limited patient population and they're so busy trying to handle those patients that they're not going to be able to recruit everybody together to get some answers just from the patient's perspective. So that's what we're trying to do. And um, also being a small organization, we're running into problems with uh, what, what we should do. We want to be very careful that everything that we do is ethical, that it's appropriate, but we're doing research from our organization working with the specialist MDs. And so it's a big question to me, and I'm wondering if you had any comments on that or because we, we actually, there is no one else who would create a patient database other than us. So that puts us, you know, and we can work with people, but we're starting to look at research grants and trying to figure out how we would go about that. So I was hoping you could just comment about those things and if, if the other question is um, if, you're, if you are available to work with um, an organization like us to sort of help us sort through some of these different issues because that's the difficult part. Absolutely. Um, let me, there's this term called orphan diseases and I, I think you would probably count the mastocytosis as orphan diseases because, and they call them orphan diseases because there are so few people with the disease that it doesn't make money for any one drug company to develop a drug for this or it doesn't make money for any one diagnostic. And it also, and, and, and so the orphan disease it kind of it kind of became that name because they did never got drugs that were technologically um, possible. They were the orphan in the room. You know, they they no one would spend money on it because there just wasn't money to make if you developed it. Um, but it had more implications. It had more implications because the average primary care doctor would never think of it. Um, it's you have so many orphan diseases that you don't think of. You can't teach them all in medical school to, to be at the forefront of someone's brain when they're, when they're trying to um, diagnose a patient who's coming in with a current, certain kind of rash um, or, or whatever the symptoms are. So they're orphaned in more ways than the, than the term was originally designed for, which was just medications. Um, and so it's fantastic that there's an organization like yours, and I don't think they would exist if not the internet, because now it's not letters going between people, now there's, um, it's just signing people up, um, and all of a sudden you have a community. Um, yes, um, the CTS, the, the CTRIs of, of United States um, do communicate with each other. Um, so I'm in community engagement for our Clinical and Translational Research Institute, um, and um, we have we have a way of partnering with one another and communicating with one another. And I think um, bringing together specialists who, um, and maybe there's only three in all of the United States, who deal primarily with this disease as their major research, you know, um, bringing them together and letting them know that we're available in our communities to help them uh, find people um, is something that we should be doing, and, and not that we've done any of it yet, but it is, um, it is something that I, I feel a responsibility for. Um, so if there is ways to work with other orphan diseases, um, including mastocy mastocytosis and, and, and any others, yes, I think we should be doing that. And so you would be interested yes, yes. and willing to answer some questions? To engage in conversation, find out how we can help For me, it seems like an interesting study, too, in how patients and researchers and physicians and companies can work together to speed up the process, because that's my ultimate goal, is to speed up the process for therapies, um, looking at the research and knowing what some of the patients are experiencing and I have the ability, sort of maybe a different perspective than some of the MDs who are so very busy trying to just deal with what the patients are Absolutely. coming up with in their office and the treatments and that sort of thing. So it's sort of tying everything together, but it's sort of been... That, that seems that's, very clear, but a corollary question before you go. Yeah. So 
Um, there's, there is, there's something behind this which is, a, is a, a bigger challenge than a lot of people think about. So let's assume that a given study um, where somebody has a treatment or a diagnostic approach, whatever it is that they want to do, needs 100 people with mastocytosis. And um, there are five such studies out there, and there are only two or 300 people nationwide that could possibly enter those studies. Is, what's your sense of how that should be handled? Should it be first come, first served? Would you like to see clinical researchers somehow score those studies as to which ones might have the most value and might pay off the quickest? Or, or is that something Definitely you think Definitely think the patients <laughs> would need more input because, the, and that's one of the things that we do. So if there are clinical studies, we make sure that we talk to our medical advisory board and that the research committee uh, figures out a way to translate that to the patients so that they understand what the studies are about and um, how it, what it might or might not do for them and whether the study actually makes sense. And so de definitely we go, if we have that sort of thing, we go to our medical advisory board. And I think, you know, that it's very hard for a layperson to understand even what the disease is or diseases in this, our case, but actually what it, what it entails and what, what the, even the symptoms are or what sort of problems or gen genetic mutations involved. It's very confusing. So when you bring in a study, you want to make sure that they really understand what they're getting involved in and whether or not it'll be useful. So definitely, I mean, more information needs to be given to the patients so that you're not just dumping it out there. We, we don't have that much. <laughs> As we, we do have definitely studies going on, but in our case, we'll, we'll advertise, but we, for an organization, but as we grow and as more therapies, potential therapies are developed, then that's definitely, you know, hopefully a problem we'll have to deal with, <laughs> actually. Thanks, thanks very much. I, I so hope we'll, so. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. That was very useful. Next. So. Having um, made my career in biotech for many years, I can say that what was m many of the topics that were uh, raised tonight have been the same recurring topics for decades. And I'm sitting here and I'm waiting to see, well, I think we've discussed these issues and uh, you know, we're bringing them up again. But what I'm missing, it, it's like, when are we going to start looking at really, truly innovative ways of performing clinical trials. So we've jumped from you know the, the concept and suddenly we need recruits and we do skip this education part which the lady over here brought up. Now we're talking of new approaches such as Twitter and you know uh, computers and I'm looking at that and I'm saying well you know how realistic is that when you're targeting a myriad of populations many of which aren't using computers, are never going to use computers, don't want to use computers, et cetera. So what might be a practical approach? So I started thinking about when uh, communities such as organizations for specific diseases, they do such a tremendous job of hitting you for money, you know, donations and such. As part of an education program, what can the universities do or even the pharmaceutical companies or the biotech companies, et cetera, uh, what can they do about education because I think that that's a, the big gap that we keep kind of skipping over. Oh, we need education, but we're not doing it. We're just not doing it. Why can't there be just a time to sit and think about, think through how we might bring this education into the community, not on a one-time basis, but on, a, on an ongoing basis where we should start teaching kids about what clinical trials are in science class. So by the time they get to college, they, they understand the concept. Why don't we have uh, lectures like this that are what are clinical studies about and doing them throughout the community and continue to do this. So by the time somebody in a community says we need recruits, they already know what the heck's going on. I'm missing that and I, I didn't hear it tonight and I haven't heard it before. Why can't we go more into that direction? How can we be more practical about how we're going to convey education about clinical studies, what it's all about and what's in it for you and how does it work and so on? Well, thank you for I think some very innovative ideas. I'm, I will say that um, I agree that you know we're when using researchmatch.org, we're only reaching people who have the internet access and who are proficient enough in English. Um, and it's not educating people on what research is. We actually developed a high school class for science on what is a clinical study. And we've also presented it at the science fair. And in an hour, we do this experiment where we um, 
We give people um, a chewy food, like a cookie or a chip, and, um, and we tell them that um, hi dental hygienists um, say that if you eat a carrot after a mushy food like that, you can clean your teeth out of, um, out of this um, chips and, and, and you clean your molars out. And, um, but there's no proof of that, I say. So we're gonna do an experiment in this class and half of you are gonna eat carrots and half of you don't and we're gonna call one of you a control group and one of you an intervention group and we're gonna randomize you. We bring in, all, we bring in a, a consent form and we do this fake experiment or a real experiment in this classroom and we try to teach in a very practical way what is clinical research so that they don't leave high school with um, complete illiteracy um, in such things. How many high schools have adopted that? Well, not that many. We've sent it to many high schools, and we ha sent it to many science teachers, and we um, got uh, some very promising things. San Ysidro does it now annually. Another high school liked the curriculum that I developed, and they, but they made it much better because it was a real teacher, not you know, university pediatrician, and they, and they sent me their curriculum, and now I send out theirs. <laughs> But there's not that many high schools that are using this, and it's not required curriculum in high school. So, so your, your plea that it should be required um, is, is well, well taken, and, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. Clinical studies aren't going to go away. So we really need to move in a direction where we're integrating that knowledge into communities. Right, we have to integrate. Examples, a million examples of what you just said it has to have to happen. <coughs> Thank you. So that's an, an excellent point. Now, we are pushing right up against 7 o'clock, so I'm going to have to ask, um, I, I think we only have one more question, and I'm going to have to ask you to be as brief as possible with your question. <laughs> so. <Okay. laughs> All right. Uh, well, my question was similar in, in some ways to yours about your son was trying to find a, an opportunity to participate in an act activity, but there are some people who actually have something and they, they want treatment or they want to participate in a study because they're hoping that the results of that might actually help them. Um, I have a daughter, for example, who has Cushing's disease and so she's a, you know, supposedly very rare, it's one of those orphan type diseases. And so she wouldn't need to get paid, she just want it like, hey, somebody deal with this. Uh, so um, it seems that the part of the problem is not so much the objective isn't so much the clinical trial, although that's an instrument, obviously, for doing it, but how does a person in the, in the community connect up? You know, what, there's no standard process for doing it. You can't go on Google and say, oh, I want to find the Cushing disease. Well, actually, actually you can, um, but it's, there's a website called clinicaltrials.gov. Not all websites, not all trials are on there, but most are. Um, the problem is, is that unless you're very, very scientifically literate, um, the description of the studies um, is very, very um, difficult to understand. However, you can get your doctor to do it for you. But basically, you go onto clinicaltrials.gov, and there's a blank there, and you can type in San Diego, Cushing's disease, um, and you can find any study that's going on in San Diego with Cushing's disease. If you you can actually pick a mile radius. You can put within 500 miles, because you don't mind going up to Los Angeles. And, and then they will give you studies that were within 500 miles that have uh, Cushing's disease in there. And um, again, it's very difficult to understand um, the descriptions of the studies. So you, it's good to work with your child's primary care doctor when you do that. Um, and, and, and you can find some things that are going on. So unfortunately, we're going to need to close up, but I know we'd be happy to answer I'll individual answer question questions right afterwards. afterwards. Um, and as, just by way of, of summary, we heard a lot of really good ideas, and I want to thank everybody for, for getting involved in the conversation. Um, I mean, just three things that come immediately to mind are two of which really emphasize strongly the need to do something in advance, to lay the groundwork in order to be able to do these clinical trials. We need to do better at them. One is education, which we just talked about, and the second is the idea of spending more time in the community, working with them and knowing them instead of thinking you can come in at the last minute. And the third, this idea of the mastocytosis survey that was done that, was done that, that identifies people through that society as a, as a link. That's something that can be done nationwide and, and connect up better to the research. So before I you know, provide closing announcements for this evening, I want to now, based, this conversation has been fabulous, I want to ask you to join me in thanking not only Dr. Terrace, but all of those of you in the audience who helped to participate in that. And, 
as always, we expect these conversations to continue not only here tonight, but elsewhere. These are important conversations. This is not just about researchers and how they can do better. It's not just about how particular patient groups and how they can do better. This is relevant to all of us. We all deal with these issues in our families and ourselves, and we want to find a way to do that as well as possible. Now, looking forward, um, we are just now finalizing um, the, a series that will be for the next three months. That series is going to extend tonight's conversation in an interesting way about how best to conduct clinical research. And it's a question that was raised a bit tonight, and that is about this idea of industry academic collaborations. Do we have these collaborations, and what, do, what are the challenges? Many people are worried um, in a great, a great deal about the conflicts of interest that occur in that kind of relationship. Given that we probably need both of those partners in order to get what we need, how are we going to do that well? How are we going, what can we do better than the way we do it now? So we have three programs planned that will look at that. Because of the difference in the nature of what we're going to be looking at and the particular audience we want to recruit, it's going to be, think of the normal series here at the Fleet Science Center as being on hold this summer. And we're going to hold those three programs at a different location which will be in the La Jolla area near the biotech companies and the university and so on at the new Sanford Consortium building for stem cell research. And finally, before closing, I want to thank UCSD TV again for helping record tonight's program. Thanks as always to the Fleet Science Center, which has been a host now to 51 of our programs here at Fleet Science Center. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. And as you leave tonight, if you can take a moment to fill out the evaluation forms, which we have copies of, they help us a great deal in figuring out what to do for future programs. Thank you again for joining us.